And then Jolene Underwood has been shifting over the last several years, and you can tell us a little bit about that, to really working with emotional health and wellness. And mm -hmm. Jolene, we're glad to have you. Um, I'm going to read just a, a hair about, just a little bit about your bio. Jolene okay. is an emotional health coach and counselor in training who believes a cultivated life is one that experiences more of God and more of the life God gives. Her personal journey towards emotional health and training in Christian counseling inform the practical support she provides for spiritual growth and emotional healing. And she's got a great tool called Unleash Heart and Soul Care Sheets that have helped hundreds experience greater freedom. And um, at the end of the interview, we will put Jolene's contact and Facebook and, and all of her links in the um, comments. So Jolene, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ginger. I was thrilled that you reached out and uh, wanted to connect on one of the topics that I had shared uh, before and just um, this whole topic of, you know, emotional health. And I know that you had some conversations I saw in the past on your page about emotions and our thoughts and all that. Um, yeah, so when we, I used to do uh, Rise Up Writers, which was a community for um, equipping writers. And I found that part of my passion in that was sharing resources as well as helping us deal with like the obstacles and the rejection. It was really kind of like emotional things that were occurring. And so I just set that aside when I started grad school last year um, at the Townsend Institute, Concordia University, University in Irvine, California. And so I am currently getting my counseling degree, my master's degree, and will graduate in December. Uh, so it's been quite an interesting journey. Um, just something that I think can be helpful for people when I talk about, or what, like in my bio, when it mentions that you know, just this it, personal experience. Um, one thing that I find helpful to share is back in 2012, we moved to live in a ranch where we fostered. We had up to 12 kids in our home. We were out in the country, it was in, uh, land owned by an agency. They were in the same building as us. It was a really, really intense season. And when I, when we came home from that after 14 months, I had all the signs of PTSD, acute anxiety, depression, really, really struggled to function and a lot of relational challenges. And so when I didn't have all those kids under my care anymore, one of the things that really just hit me was, Lord, things need to change. Not just this, if I'm entering like a new season and I don't want it to be just different than it was. I want like my whole life to be better than it was because I've recognized things that were kind of keeping me stuck yeah. and uh, just and struggling with speaking up for myself and that kind of thing. And I said, Lord, I just want to heal everything, like lifelong stuff, whatever that takes, let's go. And just kind of started from there. And now I'm counseling others. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, um, I'm the author of the book, Holy in the Moment, mm -hmm. and, yeah, right here, Holy in the Moment. Um, but anyway, there's a chapter on surrender in mm -hmm. the book. And what you're talking about is coming to that place where, I, I don't know, maybe the cliche version of it is coming to the end of your rope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but sometimes God, well, in every believer's life, God allows us to go through some challenges that Bring us to the point where our old strategies. Are Sorry, I just bought a new clock and it decided oh. to go off. I didn't know it even had an alarm on. Well, it's time, right? It's time. I don't know if I can stop it. <laughs> this is so funny. I'm so sorry, everybody. No worries. My dog probably All right. in our conversation too. So real life thing. So surrender. <laughs> yeah. So you know those that's those times in life where our old strategies of coping, of getting by, of dealing with emotional pain and challenges or even sometimes doing productive things like meeting goals and things like that mm -hmm. but they just no longer work and um you know th things seem to be falling apart and we get to that place where we are ready mm -hmm. to turn it over to the lord and where all of our strategies no longer work and and that's when that you know lord do whatever it takes to mm -hmm. move me out of the stuck place this unhealthy place and um so i appreciate your sharing that with us and you know one of the things that just amazes me is what god can do with surrender hmm. 
you know, it's like surrender that prayer of Lord, whatever it takes, let's mm -hmm. do this, how that opens the door for God to work. Mm -hmm. And so just thinking back to that time when you were come, saying that prayer to the Lord, what is one of the first things that God did that showed you, hey, we're moving, you know, what's <laughs> the first steps he gave you? Um, you know, I think, well, as you were talking, I think this kind of applies to that first step because um, sometimes I think the, my perspective, one of my struggles always was that I would do so many things out of duty and obligation and responsibility, but then I was taking on too much for myself and too much of other people's responsibility. And I was really struggling with my voice, like I said before. And so even in the concept of surrender, I could get stuck with, okay, just whatever, and then I'm helpless. Mm -hmm. and I don't respond and so as you were talking the thing that came to mind was just surrender and respond and so it's it feels like this position of just kind of okay I realize it's not working there's things that I do that I need you know maybe to change doing or I just need to receive some grace because it wasn't healthy so that I can move forward and respond to what you're you're saying for me to do next and one of the things that was the most clear and loud and life altering for me <laughs> came a little bit later when I was crying, like just felt like buckets of tears. And I could just envision, I envisioned like I could see Jesus literally with this bucket, taking my tears and I was in the bathtub and just like dumping him in this big you know, lake of water, whatever. And I was like, Lord, why aren't you doing these things and making these people do the right things? <laughs> Cause I had it all figured out what the right stuff was. But what I heard from him was, I've given you what you need, now walk in it. And so the one of the biggest things for me was that surrender of figuring it out, mm -hmm. just acknowledging that I need more than I have within myself and responding to the best understanding that I had of what God was saying. <laughs> Yeah. And so that responding, like the best idea, the best understanding that we have, we can get caught up too of just, okay, if I still don't have this figured out perfectly, what God is saying, and then I stay stuck in that is no, I'm going to respond. If that means I start to say two words to a person when I feel fear that I would, you know, like kind of feel confrontational, for example, or a different opinion <laughs> with people who have strong voices, that was really scary for me. And so it's things like that. Yeah, so that that responding piece, you know, part of what you're talking about is making that choice in the moment to take one step to do one thing. And I think maybe I'm inferring a little bit from what you said, but it sounds like almost like giving yourself permission to not do it perfectly, but just mm -hmm. start taking that step. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like when I look back at some of my journey, I feel like there was times where I wanted to make a step forward to to process things in a healthy way, but I also had this perfectionistic mindset that I brought with me sometimes. And I was like, well, if I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to surrender to the Lord, I'm going to do it perfectly. And if I'm mm -hmm. going to take that first step, I'm going to do it perfectly. And part of that journey for me was learning to let go of that and let it look like however God wants it to look like. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when it comes to like entering into a difficult conversation, I've been through some of that too, because I'm, I'm very definitely a people pleaser and a conflict avoider. So to speak my mind and give my opinion in a tense situation is hard for me. And, and I would, you know, first make those, some of those first steps to, to speak up and it didn't always go well. And then I would, you know, like, Oh, why did it go perfectly? Because I, I spoke up. But it's, it's the process. It's that process of, of learning to take those steps and entrust the results to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And um, just anything pinging in your thoughts as I talked about those things. Yeah, actually, it's a principle that Dr. Townsend talks a lot about. Um, so part of what I learned at school is his uh, character structure model. And you'll see this in Cloud and Townsend's book. If you haven't heard of them, they wrote the Boundaries books and Boundaries and marriage, boundaries and parenting, all those. There's a lot of really great content. But my favorite book is actually Dr. Cloud's book, um, Changes That Heal. And these four character concepts are in there. And so what I'm hearing you talk about is we have people like us, I guess, you know, that people pleasing, that perfectionist mindset, wanting to get it right, 
we can really kind of split into this like need to be all good so that we don't experience any bad. This is really challenging to tolerate the bad feeling with someone else or like the feeling of maybe somebody doesn't like us. What is it like to actually tolerate that feeling? And so the character um, structure that comes up is called integration. And that is integrating good and bad realities in life. And so for an example, when we're talking to someone and they do have a different opinion and it, and we feel like it is important for us to share. It's not always, you know, part of my learning was wisdom later. Like, when do I actually want to speak? When is it's just not, this doesn't work. It's not going to be timely. Um, but in doing that, there's a good and bad reality. There's this good that I'm moving forward in and the bad feelings at the same time, but that doesn't mean that it is bad right. or that I am bad. And so what he talks about the remedy isn't going from being uh, bad to good, which is kind of that pattern of trying to move from messing up, failing, not getting it right to trying to get it all perfect. The remedy is those from those bad feelings and that guilt to moving into a loved position. And when we can, when we have opportunities to experience either directly with God or um, with God through people and, and situations, that feeling of still being loved when we mess up, it strengthens us. Yes. It's powerful. Point. Oh, so I put in the comments, cloud uh, changes that heal, uh, just for anyone watching who might want to go back and look that book up. I love books, so I'm always all about the recommendation of a good book. And so thanks for sharing that. Well, you know, we talked about um, the title of this is Healthy Ways to Process Emotional Pain. So let's jump into that topic a little bit, Jolene. What is um, the first way that you want to share with us that is a healthy way to process painful emotions? Yeah, the first thing, and even in my original list, they're not necessarily in order, but I do, I feel like this is probably the number one first thing that we can do. And it's very simple, it's very practical, and it's helpful, especially when emotions are really intense. So one of the fears that we have about even processing emotional pain is that we might get stuck. And so when we know that we have some ways to not stay stuck, um, and these tips are kind of part of that, but that first one is a principle that Dr. Daniel Siegel, um, I believe he's the one that coined the phrase, name it to tame it. And so what happens is you name the feeling that you're having. You just say, I feel anxious. I feel sad. I feel angry. Whatever that emotion is, you just say that you're feeling it. And it has incredible what actually happens is there's a chemical that's released in the brain that starts to bring some soothing into the brain's reactivity at the moment so when i asked dr townsend about this one of the things that he says is so for example if on a scale of one to ten heightened emotion is ten you're like at eleven naming it to tame it can bring it down to like a nine or an eight mm -hmm. so that you can do the next steps so just naming the emotion that you're feeling at the moment you know and I talk about that a little bit in Holy in the Moment. Holy in the Moment is not a counseling book, but it grew out of uh, some counseling that I went through. And it really amazed me the power of awareness. How mm -hmm. many things are like going on in our heads that we're not really paying attention to. Mm -hmm. We're impacted by it. Sometimes it's driving our responses or emotions or decisions or opinions. And Becoming aware mm -hmm. is very powerful. And one of those, you know, part of becoming aware is to name what we're feeling. Mm -hmm. and, um, it just, I don't know, maybe I was, you know, very much a <laughs> non-intuitive emotional person, but, you know, that was revolutionary for me. And it's so very simple. I, and tell us the name again of the doctor who coined that phrase. Sure. Dr. Daniel Siegel. Okay. S I E G either E L or A L. That was revolutionary for me. Yes. And it's so very simple. <laughs> I, and tell us the name again. Like, we're going to have that patient or audience Dr. Daniel for me. Oh, and yeah. it's so very. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> so I'm, not Next, uh... that. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to comment on the, on the thing, but I must have like hit the audio on. Well, anyway, it's, we it don't happen get into the ridiculous back end of things <laughs> go on when you're trying to broadcast. Yeah. So anyway, but so that's a very powerful one. Can you give us mm -hmm. a, um, maybe an example of a time when 
being able to name what you were feeling really to kind of bring down the intensity level? Well, you talked about awareness, which includes several facets that you brought up. And I totally am with you. I feel like awareness is definitely the first key to a lot of things. And one of the things is that um, when I have felt really highly anxious, um, that's usually kind of the more challenge, challenging one for me, saying I feel anxious, has a, I can feel this shift starting to happen in my body. Mm -hmm. But if I don't have any awareness to even what's happening in my body, then I don't necessarily notice it. I might just notice that I can start thinking something different. So like the thoughts are just screaming in my head almost, or they're going in that repetitive fashion by saying, I feel anxious, then suddenly I could shift gears. And so I've done it when I'm you know, just working through the house and somebody's saying something over here, somebody's over here, and it's like all this noise again, which reminds me of, you know, other times when I had lots of noise around me, and then just pausing for a second, going, oh, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now, and it kind of even just gives me permission to, okay, that's just something that's happening right now, mm -hmm. it's not going to stay, I'm in process, <laughs> yeah, so I don't have like a specific, I just know several times that I've done it, yeah. and noticed that shift of the, the state inside of me. Excellent. Well, and I think it's so interesting what is happening neurologically mm -hmm. when we shift our thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure that you probably will mention some other things with that. Let's talk about uh, the second one. What's another? Okay. So the second one that I listed is to feel the feeling. Um, going back to what you said about awareness, um, one of the things that I think keeps a lot of us stuck, especially as believers, um, it's just different ways that we tend to use spiritual concepts, or as I did a post before called different way, five ways we use God to deny God at work. And mm -hmm. so it, it can feel so uncomfortable to deal with it, or we can have all these underlying beliefs that it's not okay to have any anger. It's, um, and then maybe situations where we didn't feel like it was ever okay to cry and we have to be strong and, and maybe things that we mentally know aren't true, but feeling the feelings, when we avoid those feelings, they just, they don't disappear. They just go underground. So naming the feeling, and if it's something like sadness, so for, here's an example. Let's just say um, I'm doing something and all of a sudden I'm reminded of something that I, I lost. Like it was a past relationship, it was a challenging situation in my past and there was some loss tied to it and there's sadness that comes up. Now I could be, I don't need to feel sad. This isn't that important and just shove it away. Or I could say, I feel sad. And then I just allow some of that sadness to the surface. And I feel some of those tears. It's actually allowing me to process the grief that goes with the situation that made me sad in the first place. Right. And, you know, when we have emotions that we're not processing, things are happening neurologically within mm -hmm. us. And, um, you know, our stress responses and all kinds of things. And when we don't process, it's, it, we just kind of store it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, I can think of times in my life where all that stored up stuff, you know, all the stuff that I would stop, 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 mm -hmm. and ignore, 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 would just kind of build up and it, it would start leaking out other places, other ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we can, we can only contain and hold so much emotional pain at one time. And mm -hmm. Um, so I'm almost wondering, if, you know, giving yourself that permission and, and making the time to feel the feeling, it's almost mm -hmm. like letting some of the water out of the dam, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. relieving some of that pressure. And um, do you feel that there's, have you seen what, any difference between how men and women process things? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that, um, Sometimes women are more in touch with their emotions, but mm -hmm. so sometimes more um, careful about not dealing with difficult emotions like shame or anger or, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the ones that aren't as um, nice to talk about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know there's some studies on the differences, but um, my perception, you know, men and women, I think it's more common that we see the message portrayed to men that it's not okay to cry and it's more manly to take control. 
And, but I think just things just kind of look different. You know, sometimes as women, I think we tend to show our emotions more easily. Um, and you can kind of see it in our faces or whatever, but um, because of, I don't know, I just feel like the messages that men receive a lot have um, kept made it challenging for them to experience an opportunity to feel like, okay, God created emotions. I mean, we all experience them. They just, how they come out looks different to people. Um, and there's a book that a guy wrote um, about men and emotions. I will try to remember the title and I could share it later. Um, but it was, he was a guy that talks about kind of the emotional prison that he lived in and he's lived a really hard life and just uh, the freedom that he experienced when he started identifying. I and mean, this is like one of those mainly men looking kind of guys, you know, yes. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but this is kind of some thoughts that I have about it. Yeah, well, you know, and I agree, like, big boys don't cry is kind of one of those cultural cliches that just mm -hmm. is, is around. And um, so yeah, thanks for fielding that question. How about um, number number three? What's another healthy way? Um, so this one is another practical tip and it's breathing. And it may seem kind of silly, but I do have a couple of videos on my YouTube site too that I've done for my clients to guide um, just breath work. So for, for one client, it's just focused on um, breathing because the, the anxiety can get so intense that breathing stops or it becomes super shallow. And there's ways that our nervous system is designed and ways that we can breathe to help our nervous system calm down. For example, if we have a longer exhale than our inhale, it allows the parasympathetic nervous system to kind of calm things down. And so I have another one that's just kind of a relaxation exercise. And so I do some mindfulness of noticing where you're sitting and then um, the breath work. And so there's different breathing techniques that could be like a inhale through the nose for four counts, hold the breath for four counts, exhale for six or eight um, out through the mouth. So in, and if you just pause and do that for a second, notice if you feel any shifts inside your body. For some people that's challenging because maybe they have compromised lungs. And so there's another technique called squared breathing, which is four, 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 four. So it's in, hold, out, hold the breath. And some people prefer that, but just pausing long enough to notice the breath and slow down the breathing with something that's guided like that can shift the physiological state so we can continue to deal with what's coming up. Yeah. You know, and when you think about it, God created us body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we want to separate those things out. You know, like, okay, here's the physical stuff, which is totally separate from the soul stuff, which is um, mind, will, emotions type of personality versus the spiritual things. But in reality, it's, it's integrated in an organic way. And what impacts us emotionally does impact us physically. So it mm -hmm. makes total sense that you could address something physically and have it mm -hmm. settle you down emotionally. Um, thinking of, um, you know, just like maybe some other physical things that you can, that we can do that either help or hinder mm -hmm. our emotional states. One thing that comes to mind is like when I'm feeling anxious, the very thing, the very last thing that I need to do is drink coffee <laughs> or watch a um, suspenseful movie. <laughs> you know? Like those two <laughs> things take... Any Rev it up <laughs> that I have and ramp it way up. And mm -hmm. so that might be an example of what, mm -hmm. you know, some physical things not to do, but mm -hmm. the breathing is a physical thing that really can help us. And there's been so many studies on breathing and relaxation and stress and emotion. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating area, but mm -hmm. it surprised me at all because God is, He's crafted us so amazingly well. Yeah. And we just understand the tip of it, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I so appreciate that concept of integration and, and how everything impacts. I think of Dr. Gabor Mate, he's not a believer, 
but um, he does a lot of work on trauma and did a, the video that I shared um, in my community, The Wisdom of Trauma. But he also has a book called The Body Says No. And what he talks about is the impact that people have from not dealing with emotional pain mm -hmm. and not attending to their the physiology and how that physiology changes. Like our physical bodies say no. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. I, I, I need help. I need some support. And the integration piece piece with um, body and spirit. So when I do the breathing, my natural tendency is just kind of like meeting God in that moment. Mm -hmm. It's a few seconds and just kind of, Jesus, you're with me. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to integrate the two at the same time. Right. And, you know, I can think of... Um spiritually you know breath prayers are um, you know kind of those quick prayers that we send up just that are just a breath they're just a phrase or a word that we send up in the moment uh when we you know need help when we uh, need to calm down and things like that but you know what you're talking about really is the ability to combine that concept of a breath prayer with breathing exercises and mm -hmm. that, that is part of a meditative mm -hmm. mindset um, mm -hmm. which is very powerful for calming us down mm -hmm. so great stuff on that how about um how about another one I know you've got several things to share with us so I want to make sure we get through most of them <laughs> well you just gave a great segue into the next one <laughs> well, I'm good at that you know <laughs> It was just like you planned it. Uh, so the next one that I put down is allowing emotions when we're praying. So one reason this can be helpful, not, you know, this isn't a problem for everybody, but for me, for example, I noticed that if I started to feel anger, it was not okay to feel anger, especially if I felt angry with God. And it wasn't until I started really diving into the Psalms again and other scriptures and realizing wait a minute, some people had anger and God met them in that place and they were okay. And so I started, I started with journaling, kind of just saying, Hey God, I'm actually feeling really angry. You know, in my mind, I know he's stronger than me. He's better than me, but I needed a chance to feel like I was going to be okay if I felt that anger. And so when I'm in prayer, I can, I, I want to feel that emotion and experience it with God. Like if I'm engaging in presence with God, knowing his love and his goodness with me in my messiness, he's not judging us. Mm -hmm. He's meaning us in it. And he's offering ways to, to come out of it to, and, to, and see hope again. And so allowing that emotion, like meeting God with the realness of who we are. He knows who we're real. He knows like yeah. <laughs> this rawness of us is there anyway. So yeah. So I want you to restate that one because I've been trying to put your steps here in the comments. Um, mm -hmm. and I've got allowing emotions when we're praying. Praying. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what it was going to be, but I didn't want to put it up incorrectly. Yeah. Because some of us may have, you know, kind of more religious backgrounds to where we feel like prayer is a very serious thing. It's very, you know, like it looks a certain way and you can't be real with God, but the reality is God wants to connect to the realness of us so we can experience more of his realness with us. Absolutely. You know, and I love the way that you're talking about the Psalms. I've been reading through the Psalms for the last couple of months and really just praying through them and paying attention to the emotions um, oh. and, and how David and the other song, you know, the other writers of Psalms are, are processing and dealing with emotions. And, you know, interestingly, one of the things that I've noticed is I have never realized how many times the word loving kindness oh. is mentioned in the Psalms. And I haven't gone back to look at, you know, what percentage or how many times, but that word is, you know, popping up again and again and again. It feels like almost every psalm. And I think that that is so important for us to hang on to when we are being authentic with our emotions and when we're processing emotions. And, and to be honest, sometimes we're just so emotional, we can't help but be emotional. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but to realize that God 
one of the you know one of the most beautiful attributes is his loving kindness his tender mm -hmm. mercy and so the psalms are you know they're a really great place to to read and meditate and pray when we are trying to process our own emotions so um yeah Dave, as, you were, that? as you were saying that it just occurred to me you know we hear in the scriptures mourn with those who mourn rejoice with those who rejoice and if god asks us to do that with each other how likely is it that he actually does that with us? Yes. That he will mourn with us. Right. And so not only do we not have to be afraid of allowing those deep feelings with him, there's room to experience what he feels with us. Mm. Uh, that makes me think of Jesus um, when Lazarus died and him weeping mm -hmm. along with the grief, even though he knew mm -hmm. he was going to raise him from the dead he still experienced that grief and shared in that grief with his you know with mary and martha and their family and um so that's a a picture from the new testament of that concept that you're talking about yeah um beautiful well how about number five um so the next Next, we kind of talked a little bit about this, but this would be to notice sensations in the body. So remembering if we have heightened emotion, we name it and we're starting to do some breath work, noticing just kind of what's happening in our body um, just helps us to stay aware um, with what's happening within us. So, you know, one of the things that we can do is when we get to these heightened reactive states is it almost feels like everything's outside of us and everything's outside of our control. And just bringing attention to, I'm feeling tightness. I'm feeling shakiness. It's just a way to tune and connect to our own bodies. Um, and just to even notice that it's there because we can kind of, you know, have you ever been um, doing something for a long period of time and all of a sudden, like your neck, you move your neck and you're, whoa, it's really sore because I haven't moved it. And so by just noticing it gives us an opportunity to say, okay, wait a minute, maybe I need to stretch my body a little bit. You know, I could just do some stretches and pull my shoulders back. If I notice my body is pulled in really inwards like this. Mm -hmm. And I feel the sensation of, wait a minute, I'm, I'm clenching, I'm tightened on the inside and then allow myself to notice that and pull the shoulders back, allow my hands to lay back and just notice that there can be calm and relaxation in my body helps helps me shift states as well okay yeah which would also you know point to some of the um the importance of exercise mm -hmm. in dealing with emotions maybe mm -hmm. not necessarily in the moment you know so you're gonna have um, a, a a conflict with somebody say like, hold on just a minute i've got to go exercise <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, um, when we are feeling emotional pain and difficulty or just some of those vulnerable emotions that can create stress in our bodies, not only with the breathing, but also learning to incorporate exercise and stretching mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily have to be let's run 10 miles, mm -hmm. but um, maybe even incorporating small ways to bring that physical okay, I'm aware that I'm, you know, like my neck is really tight right now. And so, you know, just some of those little stretches, maybe standing up and doing some stretches, uh, maybe just a short walk. Uh, but any thoughts along those lines? Yeah, yeah. And exercising when you don't feel like it. And so Dr. Amen talks about the power of, uh, you know, some people talk about medications for depression, for example, and in the power of exercise. That, so when I was thinking, do I take antidepressants because I'm in such a bad state? Um, if I could get myself to go outside and exercise, it could have, it could potentially have some similar benefits to shifting um, activity in my brain and um, the neurotransmitters in the brain, that kind of thing. So, you know, in the moment, there's, you know, if, there, if we're in that relational situation, you're right, there's not a lot of things, but I'm going to give you a practical tip that I wasn't planning on talking about, but it's something super quick and simple that I'll tell you can do in, with, in front of people. Um, but when, when that emotions calm down enough, if you can get out, and it, even if it's just five minutes, that's great. But the, the number that he talks about is 40 minutes, four times a week of fast walking, 
um, the, the studies that show the impact that it has in the brain. Mm -hmm. So, um, and when our brain is functioning well, we're able to, to handle the emotions better as well. So I'm writing that down. So 40 minutes, four times a week, fast walking, and um, it does what for us? Um, I would, uh, my understanding is that the studies show that it has similar effects to like having an antidepressant. There's a lot of benefits to the way that it helps the brain function. Okay. So if you're noticing that you're highly reactive in a lot of situations, one thing that can be helpful is incorporating regular walks. Okay, so what I put is um, in the comments, 40 minutes, four times a week of fast walking helps with depression and reactivity. Yeah, so, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So those practical things are so very valuable. And I love the fact that you're sharing with us. Let's go to another one. Um, okay. what else? All right. So before I share that, do you, you mind if I share that really quick tip? Yeah. I was totally not on the list, but this I've shared with clients because I learned about it from um, a lady who works with children in that have had reactive attachment disorders. They're very, very reactive, emotionally challenging children. Um, and so there's uh, some uh, ADHD, you know, they're, they're struggling with fidgeting, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so the concerns for those children to have something that they can do when they have to sit in a desk in a classroom. And there's apparently a pressure point right here between the lip and the nose. And you can just look like you're looking at somebody, you know, like just like, oh yeah, I'm thinking about it. And you just push down <laughs> for like 10 seconds and release. And then 10 seconds and release. When you're calm, you're not gonna really notice very much, but if you're feeling a lot and you're in the middle of a conversation with someone that you need to listen to, just go, oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm listening, I'm thinking, and I'm also calming my body at the same time. <laughs> so you're pressing down and pushing down or just pushing? Yes. Just pressing in. Uh-huh. Okay. Pressing in like that. I don't know if you can see it in the camera. Yeah. Lick. I like it. <laughs> Especially if you're in video or across the table. Just <laughs> <laughs> great way to calm down. You know, it's, it's, our bodies really are amazing. They are. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that. Oh. I told you this was gonna be engaging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm having fun with the conversation. Okay, so the other thing we kind of talked a little bit about, I think we're, well, maybe not. So it's finding support through friends or groups, particularly people who can be present with you. And so this may mean that we need to widen our circle because it could be um, a lot of people have small circles of friends and those the friends that they have aren't really friends. They're um, people who always want to fix them, who always have an answer. Sometimes we just need to speak up and say, right now, I'm feeling angry and frustrated. I need someone just to allow me to share my frustration and just acknowledge that, yeah, this stinks right now. Mm -hmm. And when we start to know that we can speak up, it also helps other people to know what we need in that moment is just presence. And so um, I've one of the things that I've had to grow in and practice in my cohort for school is doing exactly that. I feel so much anger that has built up in the last couple of days. And I'll reach out to a specific friend that I know can tolerate it, not judge me for it. She doesn't get complicit and, you know, like retaliatory type of things, but it's someone that I know that if I just have a chance to get it out of me mm -hmm. and to express some of that anger, I don't feel angry afterwards. I don't want to do anything retaliatory, but when I don't deal with it and have a safe person to share it with. And so it can be safe people or um, groups like a Celebrate Recovery group, mm -hmm. um, other you know life groups. And so part of my passion is helping to create more of this in the global church, like church community of believers that we learn how to be present with other people so that we can have those safe spaces. Right. And what a, what an encouragement for either side, you mm -hmm. know, um, when we are the one who is emotional, but also, you know, when we're with someone who's going through something difficult, 
for some of us, for some personality types, it is like our response is to try to help make it better, to mm -hmm. kind of fix it or suggest things or try to pinpoint what the problem is. And, and there's times when that's just not very helpful mm -hmm. uh, to the person who <laughs> is um, feeling those emotions. And I'm, you know, I know in my own life, once I've had a chance to release and process some of those emotions, I'm in a better place to tackle mm -hmm. problem solving. Mm -hmm. While I'm really upset, it's not a very productive time to try to problem solve. And mm -hmm. so for those of us who are fixers, <laughs> <laughs> um, what a breath of fresh air to realize, hey, we don't have to fix other people. We can just mm -hmm. love on them and support and listen, ask engaging questions that maybe help them mm -hmm. draw it out or say it. I was thinking mm -hmm. the other day, I was talking with a good friend of mine. And as I was talking, I suddenly stopped and listened to myself. And I said, wow, I sound really angry about this. I didn't even realize I was angry. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think if you are a verbal processor, that can happen pretty easily. Mm -hmm. but, you know, that there is that ministry of presence. And mm -hmm. I love the fact that part of your heart is to create instruction and, and build communities where it is a safe place. Mm -hmm. Awesome yeah. emotions. Because we, you know, they don't teach us this in school. <laughs> they do not teach us how to handle emotions well or how to help others handle mm -hmm. emotions or to listen when others are, you know, that's just not part of the curriculum when two plus two is four and you know, learn your biology. <laughs> it's, just, it's not. Yep. These are the foundational parts of life that when we are not processing emotions in a healthy way, it really impacts us and everybody around us. So mm -hmm. thanks for sharing some of these things. So finding yeah. support. And, you know, sometimes support comes in unlikely places too. <laughs> it does too. And uh, you have something specific in mind? No. Hmm. I think, okay. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too, is kind of this, you know, that surrender you were talking about before, um, that position of I'm ready to receive this Lord the way that you want to bring it to me. Mm -hmm. I may think it's going to happen in this place, but I want to be ready to see it and recognize it when it's happening from someone else I wouldn't suspect or a different situation. Um, but just kind of also going back to the finding the support, you know, it's also kind of empowering. It's challenging, but it's empowering for each of us to be able to say right now, I just need someone to listen and to still care about me. Or right now I could really use encouragement. I, I need to hear God's word. I need um, a resource. So there's different times that we need different things, but generally, our anxiety starts to stir up and then we decide, okay, well, this is the way I'm going to fix it by telling them this is how they can fix it. And then we're done. Yeah. Um, well, that reminds me in, in Holy in the Moment, the first chapter, I tell the story of um, dealing with anxiety that onset with a cross country move that was part of Graves disease, a hyperthyroid. Mm -hmm. And so I was very sick with it. And in a new community, I didn't have a lot of support system. And one thing that a friend of mine did for me that really made a huge difference was she said, I'm going to call you once a week. And this was, you know, back in the days before email and cell phones, we still had our long distance calling plans and <laughs> yeah. that type of thing. But knowing that she mm. was going to call, we had a set time that she was going to call each week and I would have a chance to talk and process and pray with her. Um, really gave me something to look forward to in the midst of a very dark and difficult time. And that really ministered to me. And, and she mostly just listened, you know, but that is something that may be helpful for somebody who is trying to support someone going through emotional pain, you know, that you, we can volunteer that and give that gift of presence, whether it's in person or on the phone or, you know, we've, zoom <laughs> you know? yeah so, whatever resources we got yes yes but that's the time that that very thing made a huge difference for me so how about number six um so writing out the raw thoughts and feelings and this is one of the reasons that one of the things that i talk about with my unleash sheets tool is asking people to get really really honest um 
So we can have this fuel of guilt and shame because we also believe that it's so bad to think the thoughts that we have or to have experiences that we have or have done the things that we have that we can't even ad- admit it to ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so writing out the raw thoughts about either what happened to us, what's going on inside of us, the anger that we feel, knowing that it's temporary, like we're just write, writing it out and kind of getting it out. And that can be really challenging um, when the emotions are really high. So I've noticed when I did some of my journaling and writing, you know, I'd go from some nice, sweet little words and I'm just copying scripture or something. And then I started to get real and honest with the gut level emotion that's going on inside of me. And my writing was just like all over the place. You can't read it. But reading it again, wasn't the goal. The goal was just getting honest with it. And then knowing that I could destroy the paper. It's not safe to keep some of that stuff around, but just to work through it. Right. And I'm wondering if there is a, like a motor neural type of thing um, happening physiologically Mm -hmm. as we write things down. Um, Because I know for me, when I, I, being a writer, of course, Mm -hmm. I process my emotions on paper sometimes, but it's not the same when I type. Mm -hmm. Not the Mm -hmm. same release that it is. And, And it's not the same, like maybe flow of insights and things like that. So I'm wondering if there is something physiological about the actual writing process, the combination from your brain to, mm-hmm. to your hand, the small motor muscles in your hand. Have you mm-hmm. guys talked about that at all in any of your training? I, I have been looking for more research on it because I'm really curious. I, I know that there's research that talks about the benefits of writing. One of the things that happens that um, I am aware of is that writing is a slower process. Yes. And so it actually, we have to kind of slow our brain down when our brain is super overworked. It can be challenging to write that out, but it's also forcing us to slow things down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I really want to find some good studies that talk about what is physiologically happening with literally moving your hand in that writing process, because there is something to it, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, I mean, this is totally off topic, but then I'm like, okay, and we're not teaching kids how to write cursive anymore. What's Mm -hmm. that? (laughs) (laughs) Totally off topic. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um, we've got just a few more minutes in our interview, okay. Jolene. So why don't you pick of the remaining, either go through them real quick or pick one that you want to um, finish off with. I can go through them pretty quick. Um, and then we can just address any more in, de- in more depth if we have any time. Um, so one is meeting with a quality mental health counselor or therapist. Um, one of the reasons that this is beneficial is because a quality therapist isn't just somebody who can listen and be present with you. They're very purposeful in how they listen and are present and guide you through working through the difficult emotions and the underlying causes of them. Um, And I mean quality, that means somebody who actually can listen because there are mental health counselors and therapists who don't. (laughs) So you can always interview. A lot of people let you, I do like a 15 minute call to see if I'm a good fit for someone. Another one is to mentally address the problematic thinking patterns, which I think is something that you talk about a lot. And um, this isn't generally, this is not gonna work if you're in a heightened emotional state, um, if you need to come up with the ideas. So like our brain gets into this fight, fight or please response and it's the, the emotions have highly triggered everything um, to the extent that we've already done some work, we can recognize, I have this belief that's coming in, I have this thought that's coming in and I have, I know what I wanna believe, I know how I wanna shift that thought. Afterwards, we can do a little bit more exploration because we have more mental capacity. Mm-hmm. What is this pattern of these thoughts that are coming in? And that's one of the things that Unleash Sheets to, does too, is to identify the actual thoughts. And so then you can start to see the patterns um, because some of the beliefs that are tied to our past experiences, which drive us, aren't necessarily the beliefs that we think we have, <laughs> mm-hmm. especially as believers, because we know in our heads, God loves us. We know that God's sees us as worthy we know that we're valuable all these things we haven't lived that experience in that um living in that love state hasn't shifted things so but noticing those problematic thinking patterns does help us in future emotional opportunities to say wait i'm recognizing even here that i'm feeling worthless right now i'm feeling invaluable because of what somebody said i have value that's not tied to it. And then I could address it a little bit more because I already about to identify that that's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, the last thing is to choose a follow-up activity. So this is kind of more in the um, 
pro quick process. So you name your feeling, just noticing that it's there, noticing what's happening and you maybe slow the breathing down a little bit. And if you don't have time to deal with it at that moment, which is common, right? Choose a follow-up activity. And if you feel like you're gonna get stuck, choose a follow-up activity. So that could be taking a five minute walk. It could be, this is what I'm gonna allow myself to watch a show or something because I've felt a lot of emotion. I've worked through some things and now I just wanna relax my brain. It could be a hobby. It could be cleaning. So sometimes I don't like cleaning, but when I need to keep myself busy and, and cleaning works. So those oh, are the last three. Yeah, so um, I've got nine. So I'm wondering okay. if I missed one. So I have, uh, maybe I didn't put that. Name, name the feeling, feel the feeling, breathing, allow motion while praying. Notice sensations in the body, find support through friends and groups, write out the raw thoughts and feelings, meet with a quality mental health counselor or therapist, mentally address problematic thinking patterns, and choose a follow up activity. Okay. Well, I got, I think I got them all. So, <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Well, Jolene, thank you so much for meeting with us. And before we sign off, um, tell us, you've mentioned a little bit about your soul care sheets. Tell us mm -hmm. anything else that might be good to know about those and how we can um, access those if we're interested. Okay, yeah. Um, so it's a simple PDF download and I have training videos that go with it. I sell it at, on my, you can go to my website, joleneunderwood.com forward slash unleash um, or a cultivatedlife.me. Um, that's where I'm going to host courses and future content to help people in different aspects of growth and healing um, is a cultivated life.me. So then these sheets, uh, just a real quick backstory, they came about when I didn't feel like I could write anything because I was so emotionally overwhelmed. So I have to create something. I thought I was going to create a planner, <laughs> but as I, which is, of course is really easy to do, right? Um, so I started thinking of different questions though. I'm a self-reflective person I, and these questions were coming up. If I was gonna have somebody use a planner, what would I want them reflecting on in their life so that they could actually connect with themselves and with God mm -hmm. and, um, which helps us connect with other people better. So anyway, what I realized was happening is I was creating something different. I didn't know what it was. And I felt the spirit just kind of guiding me in a step-by-step, -step, like, you know, move things over here, do this. And what ended up happening is kind of this flow that helps us take a break to notice we could do it you could do it weekly you could do it as you start to notice there's reactivity in your life there's a challenging situation there's a decision you don't know what to do with like different ways that you could go and just identifying what it is that's happening what thoughts am i having i have two pages of feeling words to help give vocabulary to what's going on in the soul which can be bring more awareness you're talking about awareness it can heighten awareness and then engaging with silence with god practicing hearing from him engaging with god's word and then some steps that are responding to just the whole process and what the spirit may or may not be revealing during that session. So um, they're gonna be a core tool that I will continue with some of my future you know, courses and stuff like that is the Unleashed Heart and Soul Care Sheets. Oh, I love it, I love it. So when we're done, Jarlene, if you will come back and put mm -hmm. links for all of your contact um, in, cause I was trying to cut and paste and they're not actually the links, so it's not linked. Oh. Shoot. Okay. <laughs> if you'll come back and do that in okay. the comment thread. That'll be fabulous. Yes. And yeah. thank you so much, Jolene. Um, and your website, tell us your website again. It's a um joleneunderwood.com is where the blog resides. Okay. Um, the courses all reside on a cultivated life.me. And then um your YouTube channel, what is that under? Um all the social media should be at the Jolene U. Okay. The Jolene U. Yep. So put yep. all of that in the comments for us when we're done. Thank you, Jolene. Okay, we'll do. Giving us some practical ways to process emotional pain. Again, I'm Ginger Harrington, and you guys can find me at gingerharrington.com. And um, Jolene, thanks for helping us with this today. It's been fun to chat with you. Thank you so much, Ginger. It was great chatting with you too. Take care. Bye.